So, good morning everybody. This is practically the last session from my side. On the subsequent days as I told you, you will have to make brief presentations uh, telling everybody on what your team proposes to do uh, for two weeks after the workshop. And of course, everybody would like to meet members of all the teams from all the remote centers. Today I have decided not only to expand on our understanding of structure, but to actually give, try and give a, an explanation which would be simple enough for first year students to appreciate. I noticed that because of multiple problems yesterday, because the assignment was not loaded on Moodle for quite some time, most people were unable to submit their assignments. I am therefore not giving any new assignment for the lab today. However, I would expect people to complete the assignment, namely creating a direct access file to store records which were given to you in the form of CS 101 mid semester examination. I got some queries yesterday from which I deciphered that the program which I had discussed did not make it very clear to people as to how uh, records can be directly accessed on a uh, in a file. So, what I have decided is I have rewritten that example completely with additional comments on the style in which I presented the uh, truck balancing problem. I will be discussing that. There have been a lot of queries from the participants. I would be coming back to you with those queries, but not necessarily with the answers. I would instead raise a query here and request any participant from any center to answer it. I realized that this workshop was fast turning into some kind of a class, where a teacher or his representatives uh, who are the uh, center coordinators are essentially appearing to deliver something and the participants are taking it. As I told you right at the beginning, the objective of this workshop is to create and sustain a collaborative group of people. And as I mentioned earlier, all of you are the first set of collaborators. Now, in a collaborative environment, it never happens that a large number of people raise queries and only few people are required to answer them. Everyone must feel encouraged to attempt to answer a query raised by anyone. That indeed is the principle of most open source communities across the world. With respect to C, C++, you would have seen several forums on the net, on the web, wherein a question is raised by somebody, answer is given by someone, and the question answer is classified uh, based on the topic to which that question pertains, and the whole material becomes available for everyone. Roughly speaking, in the context of first year education of computer programming, that is the kind of framework which we wish to create. And rather than wait for our subject portal to be launched in the month of October as planned, I would start in the spirit of that web portal, I would like to start the activity as an initial measure from this workshop itself. Consequently, I have decided not to answer any query myself. It does not mean that the queries will remain unanswered. But to begin with, I will pose these queries to all participants and I will expect somebody to provide an answer. As I always say, an answer need not be correct or perfect, but there must be an attempt to look at the problem and different opinions should be heard. Needless to add, me and my team will complete all answers and will put them onto the uh, uh, workshop model. In fact, I am keeping a deadline of two weeks for my team as well. So, by the time you submit your two week assignments uh, to your coordinators and to us on the Moodle, we will also publish complete answers to queries that you have raised. 
these will also include answers given by some of you with of course due credentials. So, please keep that in mind while you plan your activities for two weeks after the workshop. So, in this session I propose to discuss the struct data type in C and indicate the notion of an abstract data type and how that notion leads to the subsequent notion of classes and objects and so on. We can therefore, relate to the development of C++ and Java. It may be a rather crude comparison, but fundamentally that is a right comparison when we talk about abstract data types. We will have some examples of struct variables arrays and we will have another sample problem which is the same problem that we discussed yesterday namely creation of a direct access file and updating of the records through random access. I will very briefly mention unions, but I will only de describe what a union is, but I will not give any example. I will expect some of you to construct an appropriate example of union for the actual usage. In the second part under the miscellaneous topics as I mentioned, I will essentially recite the important queries that have been raised by all the participants and expect you to answer these queries. I will make some announcements and we will of course, have a lot of interaction in the second session. By the way, I hope all of you have clickers with you. Yesterday, I wanted to conduct a quiz. It is an important quiz. It is not related to any technical feature of C programming language but it is related to a teaching pedagogy that question. I will raise it after about 15 minutes before starting with the example of direct access file, but after completing the explanation for the notion of structure variables. So, in another 20 minutes time perhaps, I would request center coordinators to ensure that their receivers are their hardware is switched on and their receivers are connected in place. I request all the participants to keep the clickers with them as of now. Please do not switch them on. As you all know, they have a property of going back to sleep in precisely 5 minutes after you switch them on. So, do not switch them on. Even if you have, let it go back to sleep. I will tell you when to switch on those clickers. So, right now, we continue with our discussion on the structure data type. So, what are structures in C? First and foremost, a struct definition does not define any variable nor any storage is allocated. You might find this curious. So, a definition of a structure is not equivalent of definition of anything equivalent to a variable or array or even the group of bytes that the structure is supposedly representing. What it does then? It rather defines a new type. Just as we have a type of value real, uh, sorry, flow, type of value in, type of value cap. Similarly, is a type of value struct something. So, what you are defining is actually a new type. Just as we use all native types in float, car, etc., after this is defined, we can use this as a type. To understand this notion clearly, let us revisit some well known terms that we use in C program in the context of type zone. Consider float. Suppose I just say the word float. I am not talking about float A, B, C, float X, Y, Z, float M10 or something like that. Not a declaration of variable or array. Just the word float. What does it convey? This word conveys to us the way a structure of 4 bytes is formed will look like later. Notice that a float we have said always that float occupies 4 bytes, 32 bits, out of which some bits are reserved for mantissa, some bits are reserved for exponent and that once you represent the number in a normalized mantissa and exponent fashion, then arithmetic operations on the floating point numbers stored in that location in that particular way can be carried out by the computer. That is the notion of the word float. So, observe that the word float alone does not talk anything about the actual memory allocation, 
or for that matter the name of a variable or an array anything. That is why we say float is a type. I have tried to explain this gram uh, uh, diagrammatically. So, here is a query our computer wonders what does float mean. Then the computer recognizes that float means that it is a type and any variable of this type will have to be allocated 4 bytes of memory. That is the first impression the computer has when computer gets to see the word float. The internal representation will have mantis and exponent and then the computer says I will have to do arithmetic operations on values of such variables. So, this then is the understanding of the word float. That is why we say float is a type. Now, when we later on go ahead and in our program describe variables. Suppose we write in our program float x comma y equal to 23.1.4 semicolon. So, what it does? It is essentially as we all know it declares a variable x to hold a type of a float type of value and the value is undefined at this moment and it also declares variable y which again will hold a floating point type of value, but this time there is an initial value supplied 23.14. In fact, this value or any other value could out come out of a later assignment or what. Now, when we declare variables like this, it is at that time that the locations for each of these two variables are actually allocated. So, by simply saying float, variables and arrays do not pop up. That is why float is a description of a type. Now, when we make these declarations, you now look at what our C program or the C compiler does. C compiler has already known the meaning of float and this is the meaning I will repeat. For the computer the meaning of float is any variable of this type will have to be allocated 4 bytes of memory, the internal representation will have anti sign exponent and I will have to do arithmetic operations on values of such variable. So, suppose I had said only float x what the compiler would have done is it will have allocated 4 bytes called it x that is the name of the variable and it would have left the value undefined it would not know because we are not assigned in. If we on the other hand execute a statement float x comma y equal to 23.14 executing a statement meaning this statement is made as a definitive part in our program. The moment compiler reads this statement that is it is at this time that the storage is allocated for x and y and the values are put in if any there is an initial value for y no initial value for x nothing is put in x something is put in y which is exactly this value but in the internal format to represent that I have merely tried to show it as a normalized mantissa 0.2314 followed by the letter e followed by the uh, digit 2 this is an external representation of the value all of us know that internally this would be represented in some binary or hexadecimal form. But the net net only when this definition of variables or initialization of variable is done at that time memory is allocated till then there is no memory allocation. Memory could be allocated to simple variables to arrays only one at a time many times whatever and of course after this when my program is translated if that program contains an expression involving floating point variables x and y then these values will be used if there is an a further assignment the assignment will happen here etcetera all of that we know. It is in this context I would like you to look at the concept of a structure. So, in an analogous manner when we say struct new type int a float y char ch closing brass. This means that a new type is being defined which is called new type note the possible confusion unlike when we say the word float or int or char there is no variable that is seeable there. Therefore, that is a concept and we understand that is a concept of a type and the attendant implications of that type is that the storage may be 4 bytes or 1 byte for character whatever whatever and the type of values that are put in etcetera that is understood by that type. And only when we declare a variable or an array then the storage is allocated. Unlike the term float however, the term struct new type appears to be associated with some declarations right at the beginning. 
so consequently our first year students may think that the storage is being allocated to A, Y, C, H, etc., etc. That is where we need to tell them that that is not the case. When I say struct new type, although the structure itself is being defined in terms of three members, the structure still remains a notional concept like a type. So, all that this declaration indicates to our computer is that a new type is being defined. This type has three members, one of them will be integer type, another will be float type and third will be char type. So, essentially it is defining how many members that structure will have and what would be the type of individual members. Naturally, these types have to be the ones which are already known. So, char is known, float is known, int is known and therefore, we have used available types. There could be many members, 5 members, 10 members, arrays, whatever. One. Okay. Now, if this is a new type, then if variables are declared to be of this new type, whenever they are declared, allocation will have to be made for each of the three components. Since this will require 4 bytes, this will require 4 bytes, this will require 1 byte. As and when the allocation is made, the allocation will have to be made for 17 bytes. And further, these 17 bytes together will not represent a character array or any such thing. It will represent a collection of three independent components or elements. One component is integer, another is float, third is what you call cap. Okay. Again, I have tried to explain this diagrammatically. You might find it useful to explain this concept to first year students. So, I have taken the same logic. What does the word struct new type mean? So, here is the computer compiler thinking ah, struct new type. So, I now notice that any variable of this type will have to be allocated 17 bytes of memory. There will be three components, each of the indicated standard type and I will have to do appropriate operations on each of the three components now. So, it is no more just floating point operation or integer. In fact, different types of operations may have to be done on different elements depending upon the native type of each individual element. But notice once again that if I say struct new type with the definition that was given there, no storage is allocated because this is merely definition of a type. Now, in my program, after giving this definition of struct, if I say struct new type var, var is the name of a variable. Just as I could have said int var, float var, char var, I am saying struct new type var. When the compiler looks at struct new type var, it now understands that a variable var is being defined of the new type and the new type is not an individual thing, but it is a structure. Consequently, in terms of what we saw earlier about the interpretation of declaration of our integer and floating point variables explicitly, here when I give the struct new type var, now the computer will create a storage for this variable var. And how it will create a storage? It knows var has three components. How does it know it? From the definition of the new type. Therefore, it will allocate space for components or elements or members of this particular type. So, there will be a var dot a, var dot y, var dot ch. Var dot a will be an integer number, var dot y will be a floating point number, var dot ch will be a character. Although the space physically looks to be of the same size as a and y, we, and we know that is not so. It will occupy, the last one will occupy only one byte. And once I define these variables, that is what this variable, then each individual member will now start behaving as if they were individual variables of the corresponding type. However, together they represent a collection of values which totally is var and var is nothing therefore, but a, a, a structure of the type new type. I can do assignment operations, var dot a is equal to 58, var dot y equal to 23.14, var dot ch is equal to w. 
So, after declaring VAR, I can do assignments, I can calculate whatever values, expression, evaluation, etcetera, etcetera, as per normal thing. Notice the way. So, once I make these such as assignments, what I will see now is that the machine has actually allocated these values to the corresponding locations. The integer value 58 goes and sits in the first 4 bytes, 0.2314E2 go and sit in the next 4 bytes, W which is a character goes and sits, sits in the next 1 byte where dot C it. It is also important to note and to tell our first year students that unlike individual variables and arrays which are even though they are declared in a certain sequence the storage need not be allocated contiguously that is not so with structure. Structures in this respect are like arrays. Just as all elements of the array must be allocated contiguous space one after another exactly in the same fashion all members or components or elements of structure must be allocated memory consecutively. So, conse consequently there is a notion of a size of a structure. The size of this structure is 4 bytes plus 4 bytes plus 1 and we can validate this by writing some program and executing them. I shall <coughs> now indicate exactly that. So, <coughs> here is the structure definition of student info type. You will you will remember this definition from yesterday's discussion. I am saying here struct student info type. This struct student info type has 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 members or 5 elements. The first one is a character array of 30 elements of course, 31 positions because you need a backslash 0 as per the C string. Char is a string of 8 characters, hostel is an integer number, marks is an array of 5 elements each of which is a float, grade is a string of 2 characters which hold uh, the character string. So, what we have done here? Now, student info type is a new type. This by the way is called an abstract data type. Why abstract? because it does not exist originally as part of the C language definition. So, you do not have what you call uh, uh, you have int, float, char, etcetera as the native types. Any type which I am artificially defining is not a native type and therefore, it is an abstract data type. So, you might have heard the word ADT being used by students in a slightly confused fashion. The correct way to explain to them is this is a mechanism to define a new type to which certain variables and arrays could belong. And here is an example struct student info type s comma s list thousand struct info type star p. So, what we are doing? We are declaring a variable called s which is of this type. Notice that s now is no more a simple variable, just one value, it is not one value, it is rather a collection of value. And what are the collection of values? The collection of values represented by s, which is a variable of the new abstract data type is s dot name, s dot role, s dot hostel, s dot marks, s dot grade. All of these together constitute s. This is still bigger, s list thousand is an array of structures each element of S list. So, S list 0, S list 1, S list 2, etcetera, each element is actually a composition of all corresponding things together. There will be a size of this structure which will be equivalent to the total number of bytes that need to be allocated consecutively in order to represent all the individual elements and their values. Just as I can declare a pointer of type int pointer of type char, pointer of type float to point to a memory location of a variable or an array element which contains that type of value in exactly the same fashion I am permitted to declare a pointer of type struct student info type. Naturally, p cannot be assigned the address of a normal integer or a float variable or something, it must be assigned an address of 
one of the structures which have been defined as per the structure time. Here are some examples. So, when I say s dot name 0 equal to n, notice that name is a character string. So, the 0th element of name is being assigned one character value n, but name is not a standalone character string, it is a part of s. In fact, if I have five structures defined s, p, t, q, r, then each of them will have an array name, each of them will have a hostel number. This is how I refer to individual elements of the structure. So, s dot hostel equal to 12 will make an assignment to that part of the hostel which is part of s variable and s variable is a structure. Similarly, I can take the structure variable s, find its address, the AND operator works even for structures and assign it to p. Once I do that, I can refer to any element using p. Unfortunately, unlike the normal case where if I have assigned a pointer say p t r to an integer variable, star p t r means its value. Here it is not like that. In order to refer to the element pointed to by pointer p, we use a special symbol hyphen followed by greater than sign. So, p hyphen greater than sign together we will call this arrow. Notice that it looks like an arrow. It is not a single symbol, it is, made, it is made up with minus sign and a greater than sign. So, p arrow hostel will mean the hostel which is pointed to by the pointer p which points to that structure. Now, you can see a series of print statements what they execute. I suggest that you might just copy these statements, put them onto uh, your machine in, inside a dummy program and execute them, you will be able to see what happens actually. So, for example, this print statement will print the hostel number. This print statement will print size of the structure because I am saying size of s. Size of is a operator of a function which works not only on integers and uh, other types, but it also on abstract data types. Size of marks, mark is a component. So, I can say size of s dot marks, I can find out size of s dot marks that will be printed separately. Size of grade will be size of s dot grade. Naturally, grade which is a 3 element array should show the size of 3 bytes. Size of p itself pointer, you will find that this pointer length itself that that size will turn out to be 4 bytes which is exactly the same as pointers of any type. So, pointers themselves have 4 bytes representation, but what they point to could mean a, a larger group of uh, uh, components there. I hope this kind of explanation you will find easier to use with your first year students. So, just to roll back and consolidate, to our students we emphasize that a structure definition is not a definition of arrays or variables in the conventional sense, but it is a definition of a new type. Just as the word float or int conveys something to the compiler, the word structure struct something which is a structure definition also conveys something similar. That if and when we have arrays and variables of this new type are declared, at that time the storage to be allocated will have to be the sum total of storage of all individual members of that structure. And that individual members can be represented for any declared structure variable s by saying s dot member 1, s dot member 2, s dot member 3, etc. Further, there is a notion of pointer to this new data type which can be declared in exactly the same fashion as we declare pointers for integer float or whatever. The only difference is in normal cases star p or star q would mean the value which is associated with that particular pointer. In case of pointers for structure, the representation is not, is not a single value. The structure is a collection of values as I said, collection of members or elements. Individual member or element is pointed to by an arrow symbol, p arrow hostel. By the way, p arrow hostel is exactly same as s dot hostel because p is pointing to s. So, wherever a pointer is pointing to that structure variables member is what is being meant here. This is perhaps a, a slightly better way than what I have found in many books 
and explaining the notion of structure at a time. Let me also conclude this portion by reminding you of what we said, what I said earlier. The abstract data type permits us to define something of a new type which did not exist. It will have its own behavior pattern. In this particular case, for example, what is the behavior of the structure, uh, uh, what you call uh, student type, student info type. So, this structure student info type, the behavior is it has roll number, it has hostel, it has marks, it has grade, etc. And that normal operations pertaining to the individual types of elements can be done on these. When I declare a variable of the type new info type, I am bringing into existence a new object which has characteristics not as per those defined in the native type like int or something, but characteristics as described by the elements of the structure. Very, very loosely you can say that a structure type definition is like definition of a class and the declaration of individual variables of that structure is equivalent of instantiating objects of that particular class. Of course, the similarity ends here because in object oriented programming languages as many of you would have definitely studied, the classes in objects have not only data representation, but they also have methods along with. In this case, there are no methods, but the concept is similar. The ability to define something new something abstract and to give it meat in terms of the ability to process components of course, as per the standard rules. With this, I will now proceed to discuss the problem that we had briefly mentioned yesterday, which is, ah, this is, this is an additional explanation. While referencing, while referring to any member of a structure S, we use dot, S dot member. While referring to that member using a structure pointer, we use a hyphen followed by a greater than sign. So, P arrow member, I like to call this arrow. This slide is nothing but consolidating whatever we just saw in the previous example. This is how references are made by a pointer or this is how members of the uh, structure are written, structure variables are written. Okay. At this juncture, I would like to hold for some time and go over to the quiz as I promised. This is a question asking you, how will you teach basic IO to first year students? So, now while you read this question, I request all of you to switch on your clickers. To switch on your clickers, you should press ST button. If it does not show indication of coming alive, press reset and then press ST button again. Please do not just touch the button, you press it properly just like you will press a button on the remote of a TV, it is exactly like that. Please press it forcefully. Similarly, later on remember to forcefully press your answers. Okay. I presume all your clickers have started. So, let us quickly in a less than a minute go through this quiz, it is very simple quiz. Basically, it is not asking for a technical answer as I told you earlier, it is asking for your opinion. So, when you go back or when you, when you will teach the basic IO to first year students, what will be your preferred approach? A, to use scanf and printf, but to use only simple formats. B, to use simplified functions through hash defines as was shown in some of the workshop examples. So, that you use those name function like read num or read int, int or read etcetera, etcetera. Some, some other simplified way of doing it. C, to use C in and C out in the initial lectures, although C in and C out are part of the object oriented C++ language family, they are integrated in compilers like GCC and without any loss of generality, we can use them. And D, explain the complete scanf printf functionality and use these from the beginning. So, these are the four choices A use scanf printf, but simple format B use simplified functions as you had seen in some of the workshop uh, examples C to use C in and C out in the initial lectures till you discuss scanf and uh, printf 
or D, explain the complete scan of printf functionality and use this from the beginning. Now, please press your answer. Your time starts now. So, within the next two minutes, please ponder about it. It is, by the way, I understand that this is not an easy question to answer because some of you might have equal preferences for more than one of these. But you are required to do force ranking. That means you have to decide A, B, C, or D. This is the purpose is merely to get your opinion from you. So, we have one more minute. Let me switch on now to. So, I, I hope the question is uh, uh, well, well understood. A is use simplified uh, simple format scanf printf, B is use specially defined simple functions, C is to use C in and C out, and D is to use complete functionality of scanf and printf. We are approaching the closure of the time. Let me switch over to the our receiver machine here, which will collect your. Uh, uh, so, there are about 30 seconds remaining. You have to click on choices A, B, C, D. This interface as you see, if I had prepared a quiz well in time and had fed the quiz to our software here, then A, B, C and D would have shown you the actual choices which you see on the quiz. Unfortunately, I have switched off the quiz. So, only the A view people may be able to look at the quiz here, but what is coming as a video is actually no, but they can also see this. Yes, this is the advantage. Anyway, but you know the answers. So, okay, the time is up. I hope you have pressed hard. Do not press anything now, it will not matter. Now, we will be collecting responses because at the end of the clicker time, the response would be collected. We have very few centers where responses have come back from. Maybe either there is a problem in local collection or there is a problem in transferring those values. Again, I will request send the files by FTP is the request to the course coordinators, send the request, uh, send the assembled files by uh, FTP. Our primary objective is to ascertain uh, how many clickers are working and if they are not working, why they are not working. So, here we have got uh, 54 plus 25, uh, uh, 25 plus 30. So, barely about uh, 110 responses. Uh, I am glad to have asked this question because I now know that most of you would prefer to use complete scanf and printf. And I can understand why because if your university syllabus requires you to start using it right from day one, you hardly have a choice but to explain this properly and start using it. I will keep that in mind <coughs> while preparing the final material for our uh, uh, web portal, so that that material could be used directly by you at a later stage. I am going to revisit the student database problem that I had briefly uh, explained yesterday. I realized that the confusion which was reported by many of the participants was caused by the fact that I simply plunged into explaining a program which itself was ill written. What I have done now is I have added explanations of the kind that we saw when I discussed the truck load balancing problem. You will agree that such explanations are useful for our students to understand things more clearly. In fact, learning from this experience, joint experience of ours, I would suggest that all of you when you prepare your lecture notes or lecture materials, before discussing a program in the class, it would be worthwhile to add a few transparencies explicitly to describe A, the problem that you are solving and B, what exactly that program is supposed to do. I would consider this preliminary explanation to be as vital as the program itself because in the absence of it, there could be non-clarity as we saw happening yesterday. So, here is the problem statement again. Some students have registered for an elective subject. 
we are given following data for registered students entered into a text file batch input file dot txt. So, notice there is a clarity here. These are not just some arbitrary values, what they are is shown. These contain name, roll number and hostel for each student. So, notice the pattern, number of students whose data is given and in each record or each line of the text file, the name of the student, the roll number and the hostel. There are six students, you can notice that these are arbitrary values, because no roll number is 2, 2, 2, 2, 2, 2, 2, 2, etcetera. Et in fact, if you ask me, this is an extremely bad example. Any example of data that we give should not contain arbitrary values. If we are describing a problem, the data value should pertain to that problem. Notice for example, the data that I gave you for the assignment contained the actual roll numbers, actual names, actual batch codes, etcetera of the students who had registered. Now, you may not have access to the actual names and such things, but if you construct any artificial example of data, please construct it in a more realistic fashion. What I have constructed here is a very bad way. Of course, I can, I can claim that I borrowed this from another colleague of mine who had used this example previously does not wash, because if I am borrowing something, it is my responsibility to modify it appropriately. In the final version that will go incidentally on the, on the portal, all of these things will be taken care of. But anyway, as far as our understanding of the problem is concerned, this will do. So, we proceed ahead by noticing that a batch file, batch input file dot txt, a file name this is given to us. This file contains seven lines of data. First line has just the value 6 and the subsequent lines have each one, the name of a student, the roll number of his or, uh, his or her roll number and his or her hostel. This information for every student is given. What exactly do you want to do? The teacher says that he will be conducting five different types of evaluations and based on the marks obtained in these five evaluations, a later grade such as AA, AB, BB, etc. will be awarded to each student. That is the plan of the teacher. What does the teacher want? Teacher wants to create a file in which to store all the relevant data for students such as roll number, name, hostel, marks in each of the five evaluations and the final grade award. So, that is the desire. Teacher wants a file in which the records of all the students are maintained and in each record for a student, the teacher wants the following information to be recorded, namely roll number, name, hostel, marks in each of the five evaluations, the final grade award. We notice now that the data file that was given to us by the teacher contained only name, roll number and hostel. So, that is what is clarified in the next paragraph. Initially, the marks and grade information will not be available, because it does not exist. At the beginning of the semester, when students join your course, they have only roll number, name and hostel information. They do not have marks, because there are no marks, you have not conducted the exam yet. And therefore, you also cannot give any grade value. Grade will be allocated at the allotted at the end of the semester. So, this is sensible, but this is stated here explicitly, so that the programmer knows what to write. Now, the programmer understands that he will have to create a file, okay, in which to store this data, but initially, so he must make provision to store this much data. But the actual data value initially that will be available will be only this. Now, teacher wishes to get a set of programs written by us which will do the following. First, the program should create a database file which can hold all the relevant information. Second, at the beginning of the semester, records for students are created with information available at that point in time. So, the record may be this big that is created and written to the desk. However, the information may be only one portion. Subsequently, when the semester goes on, what will happen? Teacher will conduct evaluations, test 1, test 2, test 3, whatever, whatever. When teacher conducts evaluation, the teacher should be able to update the record for that student by inserting the evaluated marks for that test. So, what do we understand? At any point in time, the teacher may want us to open the file. Teacher will supply us one roll number and teacher will supply us a test number saying this, I am giving marks for second test and the teacher will supply us marks. Our responsibility is to go to the file, 
read the record of that roll number and modify the contents of the specific marks for that specific test. Eventually, of course, we expect the teacher would also like to insert the grade in the similar fashion, but this is what the teacher wants us right now to do. Additionally, the teacher says, please ensure that I am able to directly read the data for a student and update that record. What he is worried about is that if you write a program which will start reading every record from the beginning and then it will find the desired record by comparing the roll number, it may take too long. Notice that for 6 records or 60 records or 6000 records, nothing of that sort is going to happen. You can actually read the whole file sequentially, compare the given roll number and find out that record. But what if you have 60,000 records? What if you have 6 lakh records? Let us imagine this is a problem of a higher secondary examination of a state where 5, 6, 20, 30 lakh students might be appear. Take joint entrance examination of IITs where 4 lakh students appear. Take AIEEE examinations where NITs admit candidates, maybe I do not know but about 15 lakh and students may be appear. So, if you have those many students and those many marks and if some query comes that update the marks of this particular student, you certainly cannot afford to do a sequential search on the disk. That is why the problem states the program is required to be able to directly read the data. Now, it is pointed out, who is pointing out? So, I should have stated it. I am a programmer, you are the teacher, you asked me to do this and I am pointing out to you that boss direct access to a record is possible only if the position of that record relative to the beginning of the file is known. We are now talking in the context of positioning a pointer on the desk, seeking that position and making a read statement there. And we know that such a position, this pointer is not like a pointer in our program for integer or something, this is a file position. So, this position has to be known vis-a-vis -vis the beginning of the file. So, if I know the record number, I know what is the position. For example, first record will start at the base point. So, in fact, if somebody gives me a roll number, I cannot directly access the file as things are stored or as things are planned to be stored. So, now let us say the teacher agrees to allocate an artificial serial number to each student using which his or her record should be fetched from the database file. All that the student uh, teacher will want is this is all right, but first when you create a database file, give me a printout, give me a printout which will show me serial number for each student. Then whenever I have to update, I will of course give you roll number this that, but I will also give you the serial number and then ensure that you can read the data directly at that particular record using whatever file statements that you have. So, this is the explanation. It is with this explanation that we now can start writing a program. Please note the clarifications. Program should be directly able to read the data for a student and update the record. Direct access is not possible as things stand with roll number. In fact, that would be an extension that we should keep in mind. Teacher agrees to allocate an artificial serial number it is this using this serial number that the record should be fetched directly from the database file. So, now we decide to write two programs, this is our decision. First program will create the database file and will also store the available information for each registered student at that time. That is where we will write a program which will create a file and it will insert in that file the records that we have got. As a matter of creating file is merely when I open a file for output, the file gets created. And if I have got the input data limited as it is, I should use that to re create records in that file. We have to remember one thing, the input information is only about roll number, name and hostel. So, we will have to artificially assign say 0 to marks, some star star or some such artificial value to grade and then write the whole record for a student. Secondly, a second program will be written which will assume that this file has been created. The second program is to be executed 
whenever a teacher wants to update marks for a student. So, this program will be written to update one record of a given student who will be identified by a unique serial number. Thirdly, we observe that since sensitive data values like marks and grades are involved, programs should provide output for verification at each stage. Well, I have changed somebody's mark. It should not so happen that my teacher tells me serial number 4 and I type 14 and let us say that the student has got 10 out of 10. So, serial number 14 gets 10 out of 10 and serial number 4 still continues to have 0. Such mistakes are indeed possible. So, we notice that being sensitive data, we should prepare a program which will keep providing proper output for verification. Since that will be required very often, we decide that we will write a function to print data of any student. This is wrong. I originally suggest, uh, thought that I will read and print the data, but this function I then decided to write purely as a print function. So, some calling program, main program will pass the information about one student to this printing routine and it will just print all the values. That is the purpose. What have we achieved by the preceding three or four slides? One, we have defined the problem clearly and which means we have understood the problem clearly. We have made certain assumptions that even though I want to create a direct access file, I will not be directly able to access it using roll number because roll numbers could come in any arbitrary order in, in, that, in that file. So, the first record is of one roll number, second record may be of lower roll number, third record may be of higher roll number. It is not guaranteed to be sorted. So, I cannot use roll number. In fact, even if it were to be sorted, it is not very easy to see how given a roll number, I can directly go to a particular position in that file. So, we say we create the notion of an artificial serial number. Secondly, we have articulated what we have thought and understood. Thirdly, we have translated our understanding of the problem into some kind of a programming specification. We have said we will write two programs. The first program will create database and load it with the initial data that is available. The second program will help us update any one individual student's records for one test mark, where the test number is specified, marks are specified, etcetera. 